Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, thank you. And welcome to Gross Learning Organization, IEP and 504 Plans Advocating for Your Child on May 17th, 2022. My name is Kim Ani. I'm the Transitions Advocate at Groves Academy. My role at our school is to assist families and their children should they determine that their path is leading them out of Groves and transitioning back into mainstream public education, a charter school, or a private school. So I walk with the families through that, and then I assist in the IEP process and also in meeting with the receiving school to determine if a 504 accommodation plan is appropriate for the child. I'm going to turn it to Colin now for him to introduce himself. Thank you, Kat. My name is Colin Orty. I'm the assistant head of school at Groves Academy. Uh, this is my 15th year at Groves, and uh, it's a very special place, so I'm very privileged and, and honored to be here. Um, I My main job at Groves is to assist the head of school, uh, but mainly is uh, child uh, student uh, wellness um, and uh, working with the teachers and counselors in our school to make sure that they're having a wonderful Groves experience while they're uh, in our care. Um, I also work with Kim, um, Ani, and uh, everybody else uh, in the in the school to uh, work with and transition kids as they come in and out, um, and help support that as well. Um, and uh, to find uh, what they need in their least restrictive environment in our, in our setting. So working with Kim and with Ethan and all of our other staff to make sure that the programming that is set for our students uh, meets exactly the the areas that they're that they're working on and their challenges so i'd like to introduce ethan next hi i'm ethan schwer uh, i'm the director of diagnostics my licensed psychologist within the, within the groves learning center um so i help direct and manage our diagnostic team that does outside evaluations for those that, that come in um looking for um uh, working with their, their children with learning challenges or some learning difficulties and uncovering what's what's happening. We also work with our day school with uh, doing our updated evaluations and those that transition outward, helping Kim with the transition process for those from Groves that, that transition uh, out into uh, other school settings. Um, and I have been a school psychologist uh, in many uh, or in a, in a couple of different uh, Minnesota districts, also in Illinois and in Wisconsin. Uh, so I got a little bit of, of knowledge with different types of special education law and how that can differ from state to state. And so uh, I, I'm going to be attempting to answer your questions. So if you look at that uh, Q&A box uh, within the Zoom link, you can type in your questions and or in the chat function, and, and I will attempt to address those as we work through the, the uh, 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 seminar. And what I ask is with these questions is uh, if you get too specific with them, it's going to be difficult for us to answer them. Um, uh, we might not be able to answer specific questions about districts, how different special specific special education departments work, or if you have very specific questions with your kid, with your child, you can email us and we can help you work you through those. Uh, we're going to try to answer more of the broader questions um, that will apply to to uh, most others. So, if uh, but if you ask your questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sometimes I may pause. Uh, and interrupt the, the presentation if a question seems like it pertains to the whole group. Uh, and I do also have to apologize in advance. Uh, I do have two young children that are home with me tonight. So we might get to say, say hi to them at some point in time if they, if they bump into us. So, all right, so I'll hand this back over to Kim. Uh, thank you so much, Ethan. So um, here's our agenda for tonight. We've already covered introductions. We'll talk a little bit about advocacy and what that means uh, for Groves and what we ideally see that as. Um, we'll talk IEP VS or versus 504. And it's not that they're in a competition, but we try to um, explain what the big differences are between the two. And there are some similarities as well. So we're just kind of looking at each of the different types of opportunities that are there for you to pursue for your child. We'll look at IEP and 504 qualifications. That's where Ethan is very helpful here in being here. He can really dive in with us to explain the difference between a clinical diagnosis and qualifying for services and what that looks like. We're gonna stop two times for Q&A if we need to, um, just to kind of get through some of the IEP components, not that 504 won't appear, but it will. 
um, and talk really about, answer questions about IEPs and then move into more detail on the 504 and then come back at the end to look at opportunities for you to find other resources um, and also wrap up with more Q&A. So off we go, interrupt me if you need to, Colin or Ethan, as we move through. As I said, we're gonna start with self-advocacy. So self-advocacy has really four components that we like to identify. And I recognize that as a parent or an adult, or even as a student, not any one of these are particularly well-developed in everyone, but these are kind of the ideals. We'll start with knowledge of self. We recognize it's really important for a student to understand who they are as a learner. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Where do they need the most help? Now, clearly um, a kindergartner or a first or second grader may not be there, but uh, to understand all those things about themselves. But what we have experienced is a child gets into the middle school years and especially in high school, the self-awareness does develop and their ability to advocate for themselves on behalf of that increases with uh, their own development. Knowledge of laws, well, that really falls into parents' hands, right? But we're going to provide some resources and guidelines that are reliable for you to reach out to, to understand some of the laws around special education and accommodation plans. We'll share some of the background and where these laws came from, a couple of things that we have run into with them, but um, know there are places and resources out there for you. Communication skills. Well, what we do know when working with a public school or a charter school, or even a private school. No one knows what's happening with your child until you communicate what's happening with your child. Um, your child may be struggling in school, maybe having a challenge, but if they're very young, they may not be able to communicate that. So you become their advocate at that point. However, as your child develops into their middle school years and particularly in high school years, what we hope to see in students is that they are able to communicate for themselves more and more and more. And then leadership. Um, IEPs and 504s do require some leadership from you as a parent, but also I look at that too as identifying who are the leaders at the organization or the school that you need to know about and who are they so you can touch base with them and lean on them for their leadership through the process. So self-advocacy and its components. Navigating. We're going to be navigating quite a bit tonight, and I'm really pleased that Joanna has sent out everything to you because you're going to want to refer back to some of this. Um, public and, and or private schools uh, for your son or daughter that has learning differences, specifically learning disabilities and attention challenges, it, it can be pretty tough. It can be confusing sometimes. You may get confused a little bit tonight with some of the things we talk about. Um, there can be frustration both on the side of your child and yourself. There are emotions involved. Um, and frankly, it can be overwhelming sometimes. But I think the more you take time as an adult or parent to understand and to dive in and read and discover, um, I think the less overwhelmed you'll feel. However, I know Mr. Roney just went through an IEP process with his own child. Um, and I think there was some overwhelming feelings with that too, correct, Colin? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it happens. Um, it's your kid and you love them and you care very much about them. And so um, know that that's normal, um, but also rely on yourself and your, your, in, your instincts to help your child navigate and help you navigate. We are specifically talking about special education in Minnesota. Uh, we're based in Minnesota. That is the state that we work with. Ethan mentioned he has worked um, in two other states as well, but we tend to hone in really on IEPs and what that looks like in our state. Um, we will talk a bit about federal law that's involved with a 504 accommodation plan and where special education law came from, which was also um, from grown from federal law. But it is um, in Minnesota, and I say outside of Groves, uh, because we are a private school, it's a little bit different. It can vary significantly based on your student's specific needs, the disability, even the school district. And then there's private schools versus public schools. And again, not in a competition in any way, but the way that it is handled within each type of school is a little bit different. Um, socioeconomic standing and parent involvement level all are a part of success with special education and or challenges with special education in Minnesota. 
process and overview. We're gonna explore the process and provide a general overview. I think Ethan laid that out pretty well for you of support services. Um, looking at the right settings, school choice and environment. That's really what my job is, is to help parents find that school or that environment that works for their child. We'll explore some questions to ask. I want you all to know though, that nobody knows and understands your child as well as you do. And uh, really hold on to that because that's very important all the way through their lives. And then educate yourself around these topics that will help you a little bit better in advocating for your child on their educational journey. Where to begin? Speak with your child's teachers or administrators. They're with your child every day for several hours a day. If you suspect something's happening or you're curious about what's going on with your child, that is an excellent place to start. Speak with your child's physician or pediatrician. Um, your pediatrician has known your child oftentimes since they were born. And if you suspect something's going on with them, they may be able, they may be able to help refer you to appropriate services. Also, a pediatrician may go down the road of um, an attention issue with your child, or if there's any other psychological issues with your child, your physician can be a really good resource and referral source. Talking to other families that you know that may have some challenges or very similar challenges. Um, I've stood at the bus stop. I've waited for my kids and I know parents talk, but don't be afraid to talk to other families that are in your neighborhood when you run into them at different social events, which are all starting to come back now um, and see what other families are experiencing if you can. Connect and meet with the special education or 504 coordinator at your child's school to begin the process. So this really relates to if you um, are in a, in a school or you're searching for a school, who does special ed? Who is the 504 co coordinator? To find those people, you can ask your teacher, you can ask the principal, you can also search the webpage and see who's listed as the special education director for the district or for the building. Um, so finding those people isn't that tough. It's about asking where they are and how to find them. 504 coordination can come out of an edu a special education department, or it often is um, left to the counselors at a school. That varies too, not from district to district, but sometimes from building to building within a district. So do some curious questioning, find where these folks are, and reach out to them if you need to, when you need to. And then visiting potential schools and meeting with their special ed coordinator or learning specialist. So here's where we start to get into private school, public school. In a public school or a charter school, you're looking at education coordinators, special education, 504 coordinators, counselors. In a private school, they're often called a learning specialist, um, an academic coach, an academic specialist. Try to find who that person is. So frame your question as, I have a child that has some learning challenges. Whom do I talk to about that? and then find them. And if it's in a private school, um, they should be able to answer all your questions. They tend to be quite open about how their services play out. Public schools are gonna approach it with a little bit of caution. They don't know your child. They wanna make sure that they're not providing information that they can't follow up with without an evaluation. And we'll get into the evaluation part next. Anything to add, Colin or Ethan at this point? No. Okay, since you all received this information, I'm not going to go through this graphic in detail, but basically it's IEPs on the left side, accommodation plans on the right. We will talk more in depth about the laws that were created around each of these. Um, we'll talk a bit about eligibility for both an IEP or a 504, and then the documentation that often goes along with these. The overall message, and I'll probably repeat this a few times, an IEP is service-based, an accommodation plan is accommodations. It's making adjustments so a child can learn in a learning environment. An IEP is actual service time. Colin, I think I've talked enough for a bit. You wanna take over for a little bit? Oh, thank you, yeah, you did, that's a fantastic job. So, um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna dive a little bit more into, into the Individualized Education Plan or IEP, um, a little bit more about that. And, and as Kim said, we're gonna sort of keep circling back to try to help you kind of paint a narrative and try to understand a little bit the difference between the IEP and the 504 
and and whether your student maybe has one or not or is going through that process or what's appropriate for for your son or daughter or or, or students so um so a, what is an IEP? So it's a written statement for a child with a disability that is developed, reviewed, and revised through a, a series of meetings. Um, then IEP delivers direct service to your child, as Kim was just saying. So that um, you are a part as a parent, you are involved, uh, and you steer the ship um, in that in that uh, in that sphere. So um, you kind of. Uh, they can't start um, an, uh, an IEP or an evaluation without your approval um, and, and qualifying for that uh, and going through the whole process where all of those meetings are set up and explained very thoroughly with you so you understand the tests that your students will take. Uh, you just understand the whole process and you have those rights and what they call those safeguards to go through that. An IEP includes, and, and that's part of the document, and uh, it will entail the present level of performance, so where your student is at right now with the different levels uh, that they are for reading, writing, math, um, social, emotional, um, all those types of things. And we'll talk about more of the types of um, uh, IEPs that they could qualify for based on their challenges or what they call disabilities. Measurable annual goals, so every year, uh, the measurable annual goal, annual goal that they'll work on. Description of the process, which will be in there statement of services that they may or may that they will receive based on the challenges and disabilities that they have statement of participation in non special education settings so how much they may or may not be pulled out from a regular schedule that could be part of the day that could be the whole day that could be a combination of any of those things a statement of the individual's appropriate accommodation so not only does the IEP give direct services but they also provide accommodations where the 504 plan is just accommodations. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that as well. And then transition services, do they need, do they need help with transition uh, services uh, when they reach age 14 and older? So what, what kinds of things may they need, may or may they not need help with? So that could be independent living skills, that could be um, uh, social uh, skills, those types of things that are gonna help them to be independent um, those kinds of things are going to help them transition to a, a, a adult life uh, and do that well and be successful at that. Um, and then some students may transition or qualify for transition services uh, beyond that until the age of 21. Um, do we do the next slide? I can't see the bottom of the slide for some reason, but let me see. Huh. Um, let me try this. Oh, perfect, there you go. All right, qualifying areas of IEP. Um, so again, um, these are the different areas that they could qualify potentially under. Severe, uh, multiply impaired, autism spectrum disorders, blind and visually impaired, deaf and blind, deaf and hard of hearing, developmental cognitively disabilities or DCD, developmentally delayed, which is also known as DD, Emotional and behavior disorders, which is known as EBD sometimes. Other health disability, which could include uh, ADHD, which is very common at Groves Academy. Physically impaired. Specific learning disabilities, also one that's very common at Groves Academy. And a lot of times uh, coupled with um, um, OHD or with ADHD as well. Speech and language impairments, which is also very common at, at what we do at Groves as well. Uh, working with our speech team and traumatic brain injury. Um, so those are basically the 13 areas um, that you can qualify under special education services in the state of Minnesota. And these 13 areas, these are very consistent across the country. If you go to state to state, they may call these just a little bit of a different name. But so if you move from from here to Wisconsin and you're qualified for an IEP, um, you know, there are a little bit of, of rules and, and guidelines around that, but but it should kind of fit the general framework in those other states as well. So uh, I am seeing the question and answer, um, but I'll add that in and I'll jump into the question and answer. Perfect. Okay. Do you want me to take this one, Colin? Because I'm going to ask sure. for Ethan to help us too. Okay. Sure, sure. So we, we are a school known for um, working with students with dyslexia. So we are pulling this out um, specifically because of who we are uh, as Grows Academy. 
So dyslexia falls under the special education category of specific learning disability, SLD in Minnesota. More specifically, it would include deficits aligned with basic reading skills. Now I'm gonna walk through this, then have Ethan explain a little bit, um, especially on this next part. Um, dyslexia and being diagnosed with that is not, or qualifying for an IEP under SLD reading is not always the same as a clinical definition. I mean, I'm going to have Ethan tease that out for us because he's a psychologist and gets that really well. Whoops, I didn't want to do that, though. Um, one thing that Ethan has pointed out to us many times is make sure that a school assesses spelling. Um, and then the state is offering guidance that, that school should not avoid using the term dyslexia. So for my four years as a transitions advocate at Groves, um, from when I started to now, um, I am able to put the word dyslexia on a referral now. Uh, when I go to the Minnesota Department of Education, there's specific information about dyslexia and how it applies to special education and education in general in the state of Minnesota. What I'd like Ethan to do, though, because I run into this quite a bit at IEP meetings, my child was diagnosed with dyslexia, but the school is saying they don't meet criteria for a specific learning disability. Ethan, can you talk a little bit about that and where that those boundaries lie and what that looks like? Absolutely. So, um, so every, everything that, that Kim kind of highlighted are, are very important pieces. Now, one of the things that we're also seeing um, is that schools are using this term a little bit more often. Now, when we talk about dyslexia from a clinical standpoint, there's, there's three basic weaknesses that are part of dyslexia. So, and it's all with those very, very basic foundational aspects of reading, word reading, decoding, spelling. Um, a lot of times school districts don't assess spelling, so that's why we made that bullet point, you know, make sure that they assess spelling, because this is very much interrelated with your foundational reading skills. Within an IEP, um, dyslexia usually fits underneath what's called this basic reading skills. So, so uh, underneath the, the specific learning disability category. So underneath the specific learning disability category, there's eight additional areas where, where your child can qualify. Uh, there's three areas for reading, uh, there's two areas for math, uh, there's, there's written expression, there's uh, oral expression, there's listening comprehension. And within reading, it would fall underneath those basic reading skills. Uh, generally, if you struggle with these basic reading skills, then in turn, that's also gonna affect your fluency and your comprehension. Um, so uh, dyslexia is very specific. And, and, um, and if, you, if we are looking at uh, a, a child that would qualify for an IEP, they may or may not use that term dyslexia, um, but they might code that underneath, underneath this basic reading skills. And often, and I'm seeing a huge increase in this, often they do service this pretty well within their IEP goals and how they direct and target that. Um, and if there's any questions on that, uh, I'd be happy to, to chat. I see, I see a few questions come in, so I'm gonna start uh, working through these. Uh, anything else I'm missing there, Kim, before I start jumping into questions? I don't think so, Ethan. And if you feel like you need to address a question, just interrupt as we're moving through, okay? If you want to bring it out for everyone to hear. Thank you, though, for helping define that. And Kim, I think that's really important that you guys uh, um, underscored and italicized that because that is a huge question that, and then a confusing question for families. And it, it, it is kind of difficult to describe, but again, it's it's more under that SLD category. Um, and then parents, I think, have a really hard time um, with that, where they have dyslexia, yes, but how does that apply to the public school, and, and how do they, how do we qualify for a student to get them services, and, and sort of drilling down to exactly where, where that in is, that general uh, definition, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, here's accommodation plan and 504 coming, starting to pull in here. So a 504 plan, um, in a public environment or an accommodation plan, as it's known in a private environment, is a written statement of accommodations for students. Now, here's where we wanna make sure not to muddy the water too much. Colin listed that an accommodation plan or accommodation sit in an IEP, and they do. It's one of the components of an IEP. What we're looking at here is just the accommodation part that would appear on what we call a 504. So um, common accommodations. Now, these accommodations that are listed actually you would find 
quite frequently on an IEP as well. So that's why we put these together at this point. Extra time on tests. Uh, if a student can't read very fast, they need extra time, right? Uh, if they have ADHD and it takes them more time because of slow processing speed, they need extra time on testing. Preferential seating doesn't have to be front row, but is it the second row? Is it something that you want the child to select? We know that in a room of 30 kids, if your child's in the very back corner and they have it to ADHD, um, they may not be getting a whole lot from what's going on in the classroom. But when they're up front, they're on the radar of the teachers. So that's where that one comes in quite a bit. Testing in a separate room. That's very important for students that are using uh, text-to-speech uh, to be able to have a test read to them, maybe by a computer, or um, if they need that quiet, separate room space so they don't get distracted. And so they can take extra time on a test in a separate room rather than sitting in a classroom and having the bell ring and everybody get up and walk out. So that's where that one becomes very important for a lot of students. Shortened or modified homework assignments. Now there's an asterisk by modified. Private schools rarely modify. And I get a lot of questions. Well, I don't understand the difference. An accommodation is um, something that's provided to level the playing ground for or play not the playground, the playing field for your child, right? So um, it's kind of like an accommodation might be, I, I wear glasses when I have to read a lot. Um, if I don't have them, I'm not gonna be able to pull information in. That's an accommodation. Um, modifications though, are when you're saying as a class, you're going to do 30 math problems tonight, but this child, because of their slower processing speed or their um, slower reading or it doesn't go as fast for them, is gonna do 15 of them. Um, so that is a modification. Private schools rarely modify, particularly at the middle school and high school levels. They have their curriculum. The expectation is that they're going to um, do the homework. They're going to give you extra time. They're going to give you some extra space to do it, but you have to still complete the same load of work. Ethan, looks like you have something to add. I do. Uh, and I'm going to answer a couple of questions and some of these pertain to these, these accommodations. So, so I'm going to jump in and answer some questions uh, and a couple of them I, I don't really want to type out. One of them pertains to the slide that we just had is we we're talking about dyslexia. Uh, can, do you want to go back to that slide, Cam? Okay, one of the questions was, um, uh, what if my school determined if a child didn't qualify for an IEP, but, but yet afterwards I took him for an evaluation, turns out he has dyslexia, dyscraphia, and some ADHD. Does that make him qualify now? Uh, the answer is not an automatic no. It could be a yes. And I know this is a little bit of a vague response. Um, the federal the federal guidelines and what the state of Minnesota has for qualifying for an IEP are different from clinical criteria. In fact, oftentimes clinical criteria for diagnosing for learning disorders are a little less strict than what is set forth by federal guidelines. Um, uh, for, for instance, in the state of Minnesota, we need to, in, for special education and uh, for a learning disorder, you need to have a severe discrepancy between your IQ and your academic achievement. And this is a pretty big discrepancy. Um, it, 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 uh, if you don't have that discrepancy, uh, there's a good chance that you're not going to qualify for, for a learning disorder. Uh, we don't use that discrepancy model when we look at it and diagnosis from a clinical lens. Okay. Uh, so this does create a little bit of confusion between uh, these different modes or ways of identifying someone with a learning disorder. Uh, if they have ADHD, do they automatically qualify for uh, special education? Uh, when we get into a, uh, a, a talking about special education, not only do you need to meet the core features of, uh, of, of the disorder, but you need to have a need for special education. And now sometimes, and, and when we talk about learning disorders or attention disorders or any type of disorder, they occur on a spectrum, okay? And you can have some that are pretty, some kids that are pretty high function ADHD that they may not need an IEP. Or let, uh, let's say that they were put on medication and, and the medication helps address a lot of, of their core symptoms. Uh, they might not, may not need an IEP. Same thing goes with a 504. They may not need a, a 504 plan. Um, another one 
uh, asked, uh, you know, my daughter will be moving to another district. Uh, Kim, do you want to go back to the accommodation slide? Uh, in our new school, we believe she needs additional accommodations. And we're going to get to this in a little bit on what you're going to need to qualify for uh, accommodations and how to get there. Um, you, we do need to have uh, a, an evaluation to talk about that, to identify whether they need a 504 plan. Um, if you really believe that, I would request a meeting and writing. And then kind of if they have a diagnosis, that is going to make things run a little bit smoother. Uh, and and it, it, it's already has an, that that means you have an identified disability where we need to be maybe do some adjusting and, and starting to have that conversation with the school and saying here, this goes back to what Kim was saying in the beginning, you know your child the best here, these are things that I'm seeing that, that my child is struggling with. I, I really believe my child is going to need these these things, um, and these are what I think are going to be effective for them, and so these are some of those common accommodations uh, that. Um, I will be provided. Uh, and I think there was one more question that I wanted to answer. Nope. Uh, I think you can kind of jump back in, Kim and okay. Colin, and then I will continue to, to address some of the some more of these questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Ethan. And thank you all for your questions. Um, Breaking down large assignments in smaller steps is a common accommodation, particularly for ADHD and attention disorders. But also um, imagine a, a child that's not really good at writing and they are given a five paragraph assignment that's due in so many days. We're seeking an accommodation so that the teacher says, for you, I want you to write one paragraph, bring it in tomorrow. And then in two days, and so they're helping that child put that together in smaller components. Uh, so that is a, a real help for students, especially with the writing challenges. Um, copies of lecture notes. Can you imagine if you have dyslexia or you are very distracted or you're not very good at writing, listening to your teacher and actually trying to figure out how to write notes? That is a lot of, of stuff going on. It's a skill that we have to learn. It takes a lot of time to learn, but if there's something getting in the way, how about some lecture notes? Actually, that one you're finding more and more even in mainstream education outlines of, of lecture notes are coming out or being provided for students through Google Classroom or through Canvas. So um, that one used to be a big hard one to get and it's not that tough to get anymore in my experience. Audiobooks, uh, digital access to um, any kind of textbooks. Uh, one of the better things that came out of COVID in the last two years is it really pushed public school districts in particular to have to figure out how they're gonna get information to students electronically. And so books that are available through Learning Ally, uh, Bookshare, uh, even on Google um, are much, much more accessible. And I think districts are starting to figure out that is the way they need to be going because at universities and colleges, uh, there are some still books around, but most students and many students are using audio or electronic versions. And then use of electronic assistance, um, a personal computer, a supply device, a tablet. If you're looking at other schools, uh, if you're investigating what that looks like, one of the big questions is, so if my child needs assistive technology, what do you use here? Are you a one-to-one -one laptop school? Is it a lab environment? Are they expected to provide their own electronics? Um, and that's actually a question that a lot of parents have for students that aren't on 504 plans or IEPs. Um, because they want to know what, what are you using? Who's supplying it? The big question, though, is then who are they going to for guidance? Is it the guidance counselor? Is there an assistive technology person in the building? Is it IT? Is it their classroom teacher? Is it their case manager for their IEP? Who is the go-to to help everybody navigate and get through that? So I hope we covered that pretty well. Um, that's just a broad common accommodations list. Uh, of course, it can look different depending on your child and their needs, but a good starting ground. Um, Colin, I'm gonna talk a little bit about understanding IEPs. Absolutely. So um, students in special education both have a disability and are in need of special education instruction. So that's kind of goes hand in hand, right? So they have the disability and they need special education instruction like we talked about, or they need direct services. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about what direct services might look like for somebody who qualifies for that. 
a comprehension a comprehensive evaluation conducted by a team from the public school evaluates and identifies these students. So that happens first. So getting an IEP comes from the evaluation process in the beginning. If it's the first year or the first time that you're coming to the special education process, the, the evaluation, comprehensive evaluation process happens. And from that, they generate the IEP. For every student who needs special education services, the team develops a special education document known as the IEP, which we've been talking about. The IEP outlines the unique needs of, of the student and the specialized goals and objectives that will help the student make educational progress. So that's really where it's gonna drill down into the, what your child's disability is if they do qualify for an IEP based on the, the, comp, the, um, the comprehensive evaluation, um, what they need, what they'll qualify for, um, what they're gonna be working on those that, um, that year, the different um, areas um, and goals and objectives that they're gonna be working on and how many minutes of service that they're going to get and what kinds of services and who's going to provide them. So that could be from the special education teacher, the resource teacher, maybe it's a speech and language teacher, uh, maybe it's a, a DAPE teacher if they have more physical disabilities, speech and uh, or, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, um, maybe there's you know, blind or low vision as well. And so the who is going to provide uh, the services that they need. Some of our students might even qualify for what they would call OT or some kind of um, other PT from another school, whether that's maybe using the pencil, their pencil grip and working on fine and gross motor skills as well. So what disability do they have um, uh, and what, uh, uh, what areas and objectives are gonna work on and who's gonna be providing those, uh, those uh, services. And then parents are a critical partner in every phase of identifying a student for special education and establishing the IEP. So you steer the ship, like Kim was saying before, no one knows your child better than you. Um, and if something doesn't feel right or doesn't seem right uh, through the, the evaluation process and the IEP process or, or working with that special education teacher, all your answers should be, should uh, all your questions should be answered and you should feel um, that you're confident that you know exactly what your student, uh, the services, accommodations, modifications and everything that they're gonna be be provided, you should have all those questions answered um, and be feel really informed about that as well. And that's part of all your safeguards, which is federal law, that you are aware of all those things um, and that you are in 100% um, uh, collaboration and in agreement with those things as well, so. Thanks, Colin. Ethan, looks like we have some questions because I had something I wanted to add too. Go ahead. Awesome. And and Kim and Colin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, Apologize if, if you guys already talked about this. I was really in in the mode of answering questions, so I might have missed you guys talking about this. Did we talk about sure. private schools and IEPs at all? Um, not specifically. It was called out on a little balloon on the side. Do you want to um, maybe get into yeah. that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, IEPs are a, a program that that is designed for within our public schools. Uh, with that said, can someone from a private school receive an IEP? They absolutely can. Um, Oftentimes, they need to be serviced within the one of the closer uh, public schools. Um, so uh, it, the evaluation process is done uh, at a public school. For for instance, even with our school, Groves uh, Learning uh, or, or, or Groves Academy, um, we partner with St. Louis Public Schools uh, um, and or St. Louis Park Public Schools. So. So we kind of use them uh, as we transition out. And a lot of times that is our, our home school district for, for many of our students. Um, so a lot of the Catholic schools, it'll be, it'll be the local public school. So if we have them do an evaluation, a lot of times they will come to your school, they'll evaluate this, uh, the child at the school. But when it comes to the IEP and we're servicing them to receive the services, oftentimes, not always, but most often they need to be bused or transported back to the public school to receive those services. Uh, a couple instances where this does not occur is sometimes with speech and language and, or, and, and especially younger kids with speech, sometimes the speech language pathologist will come to the private school if there's a number of kids there and, and provide that service there. Um, 
but most often it is involves that the child going to the public school to get the services. And sometimes that is not worth it depending on how much time that takes, how much disruption there is in the day. Um, it all depends on, on, on different circumstances. So I have a question, will private schools honor IEPs? Uh, yes, private schools will honor IEPs. Um, it's just, you know, where, where is the child going to be served? Um, Thank you, Ethan. Another one? No, I think... That's it? Um, oh, another one. So someone, uh, I'm gonna answer one more. So I've heard, or I misheard that you say that 504 plan IEPs are not used in the public, private, or in the private sector. They're simply called something else. Uh, this is something that, that is important to um, indicate. Uh, 504 plans, that is another kind of federal law, and, and it provides to, it, it must be followed by anyone that receives any federal money. So most private schools do, do receive some federal money, and, and so they might uh, provide, they, they might, they will be required to, to do a 504 plan, but they're not absolutely always required. Most kids, most students, uh, uh, private schools will. Uh, do they always call it in a 504 plan? They do not. Sometimes they'll call it a, a learning plan or, an, or just as an accommodation plan. Um, what, what else have you run into, Kim? Where, what other names have they called it? Well, we um, call ours the Groves Education Plan. <laughs> um, well, but so, St. Margaret has, um, the, I think they, it's the BSM plan. Um, I know Carondelet did that as well. So private schools will call it um, whatever they like to call it, and that's fine, uh, as long as it's um, adequate and everybody agrees. Uh, the thing with private schools, um, it's a great question to ask, it, whether you're enrolling as a kindergartner, you know, hey, my kid has trouble by third grade in reading, um, what do you do? Like, how do we handle that? Uh, they're cute and they're young and they, they know their colors and their numbers, but what if, what if things start to fall off the rails? Um, who, who's taking care of that in that building? Um, private schools will should be pretty upfront about what they will or won't be able to do. Um, I hope that seemed right, Ethan. I had a, I had a parent tip while um, Colin was talking. So a little parent tip for you. If you're sitting in an IEP meeting, and I heard Colin toss these out, and we hear these all the time, you know, what if your kid has DAPE or OT? Right. Uh, if you start to hear things like that in an IEP meeting, you can, you can always just say, hey, hey, um, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so ask them, um, because we, I do this too, when I'm in these meetings, I'll start to, we get into moving along and talking in our own language. Um, you are there too at a table. They call it the IEP or the special edu education table. You have a voice. So ask a question, go back and say, you said, um, whisk five, what's that? You know, I, I don't understand or can you slow down a bit? I'm not quite sure what this means. So ask, ask those questions as you go through. Okay. Um, did you have anything else, Ethan, or should I move on, gentlemen? I think that's good. And, and, and I just think it's important to reiterate too, you know, if you are in a private school, um, the private school may or may not, you know, they have the ability or the option to say no to certain things um, and they do have that right. And so it's hard. It's hard to kind of navigate that or negotiate that. If you know your child, it, it seems very reasonable to you, and it might be very reasonable, but you know that might be a little bit of a struggle. Um, and so I think the more you can educate yourself around that, the more you can uh, bring it to their attention about how it's leveling the playing field, and it's not, um, you know, it's really going to service them because you're going to be able to to really have that student access. Um, the knowledge or show what they what they know rather than really hold, uh, that holding them back. And so really advocating on on how this is going to help them be a more better, fuller member of 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 your of your community and school is super important. And so um, and and really kind of trying to advocate that compassionately and 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 forcefully, but not being too forceful where where it kind of shuts down communication. So that's a that's a delicate um, I think to advocate um, while being uh, continuing to be have productive uh, conversation and, and dialogue with them as well and collaboration. So it can be challenging and no one knows that more than, than Kim and Ethan too, the, the different schools that they work with, so. Thanks, Colin, very much. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna grab, oh, 
Do you have something I mean, else, Ethan? Just a very quick thing. So uh, down at the very bottom, you will see that there are chat functions. There's a and a function. And I, and I see questions coming in both, which is great. And I love the questions. If we could keep them on the Q&A, that, that kind, of, kind of helps me keep them organized. So, so questions, mm -hmm. use that Q&A function, please. Sounds good, Ethan. Thanks. Yeah, you can, you can actually see when you've actually answered them. So it helps very much. Understanding IEPs, the language uh, as used in schools comes from federal and state educational laws, so it has a background. The laws define the criteria under which students have guaranteed rights to services. Compliance with these laws and the mission to educate all students drives schools' decision making. Um, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go through these and just point in a couple more uh, things along the way as we get to the bottom. School's primary focus is on determining the need for instructional supports, accommodations, and modifications. Um, and then they have an example, a student may have dyslexia or reading disorder and not qualify for school services. And I think we've covered that example pretty well about the clinical diagnosis and what school services look like. One thing that I run into with a lot of parents that I work with, um, you see there's laws and guidelines. Um, you, as you move into this process, you will hear schools say, well, we have 14 school days to do this and 30 school days to do that. Um, and then 14 school days to do this part. And then you have these many days to get back to me. Uh, get some clarity around that as you're talking to the school and know that they talk school days. So if they have a spring break, that's not a school day. So those five days don't count. Um, what I work with parents on IEPs, you know, they kind of roll their eyes like, oh, we did this years ago, it took forever. What I tell them is, well, it's not going to go a whole lot faster. Um, I'm just there to help you along the way. Um, and I get things done as quickly as I can on my side, so there's no delays. But um, it does take time. And dis some districts move a little more swiftly than others. It depends on how much staff they have. Um, how overwhelmed they are with special education referrals. Their guidelines and those days though are put there to protect you as a parent and your child so that a district can't start something and then eight months later come in and go, hey, we're ready. Um, so while this feels long to us as parents, right? Wow, I have to wait this many days before this starts to happen. Um, it's there actually to protect you and to protect you in that the school then can't just sit on it um, for months and months and months. Uh, I understand as a parent though, you want things done last week, right? Um, the school is saying, well, I have 14 school days. So be ready for that and to navigate that. Um, it is there as a safeguard for you. However, um, it can feel long to us as parents too because we have a child coming home that's having a tough time. So. Um, just wanted to put that out there. I think we've been doing pretty good on the Q and A. Do you feel like we're caught up, um, Ethan? I think we are. So please keep them coming in. Uh, okay. I want to add a little bit uh, more to kind of like what you what you were just talking about there, Kim. And, and I've been on the other side of it as well. It is, um, um, you know, uh, and, and you know, as we're going through this discussion, and you know, we, we we've talked about how some districts have have stronger special ed, some 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 departments maybe not as strong. You know, um, we're really trying to to really emphasize here, you know, how to help you advocate your through your child through some of this, these challenging things. And I don't know if I have ever met an educator who is not well intentioned who doesn't want the best for your child. Um, and, and so at times it may seem like we are talking, you know, uh, talk, talking down on, on schools and, and, and districts, it seems like they're taking longer. That is, you know, that, that's not our intention at all. Um, uh, it, it is really good to, to partner with them and do the best they can. And, and, uh, and, and a lot of times districts really are understaffed and underserved. Um, and, and, uh, I think this the, during the pandemic that's been very well highlighted. So, uh, but the guidelines, like Kim was saying, they're still there to to keep you protected as as a parent and keep your child protected. Uh, I Ethan, do see a thank couple... you so much for saying that. Yeah, I I don't yeah. want to come out as uh, saying oh districts are going to do this, but uh, it's about being prepared, being prepared for the language you're going to hear, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I I did have a a request to go back to the previous slide for a second. 
This one? Yep, I think so. It was an anonymous attendee, so I can't even ask the person uh, who asked the question. So hopefully, this if, is if I could, if I could say one thing too, just to kind of underscore that, maybe we can figure out what they exactly they wanted. But um, I think that's the frustrating thing too, and we'll we'll touch more on this. Is you know, like the last thing it says, a, a student may have dyslexia or a reading disorder and not qualify for services. Well, well, then what do you do? And that's what we'll get into a little bit. But that's what's so frustrating is is it's your child and and you know me and it they'll make it sound like you know when you're at the IEP that they're that they yes they have a disability and that they're not that they're struggling but they're not failing enough or struggling enough and that's really frustrating and hard to hear as a parent to say well so what are you going to do so that they don't continue to fall through their clocks or, or continue to get behind and that's frankly why a Groves Academy exists is, is what we call those in-betweeners those kids that aren't failing enough but still have challenges and disabilities. And so that's why, you know, it started in 1972, all those years ago, um, uh, and has been in existence since because we are able to serve not only kids that would qualify, but those in-betweener kids and then and and, and others as well. And so uh, those are those are really hard conversations and frustrating conversations that we were talking about um, and really understanding that they might just miss the criteria or the cutoff because the public school can only serve so many kids. They only have so many um, uh, much money. They only have so many staff, like like Ethan is saying. And and, and being a public educator before this, and Ethan is as well as we understand that too. And and um, so they have to have a cutoff and a criteria that they follow pretty strictly um, in meeting those areas. And so, um, but that's not doesn't feel good to you as a parent when you're when it's your your student because you're not going to obviously let them fail uh, and fall through the cracks. You wouldn't be here listening to us tonight. So that's that's the that's the trick and the hard part of it. So did you find uh, what they were looking for, Ethan, or should we move on? You did. And you're all squared away. OK. 504s. <laughs> A lot of uh, verbiage in here. Again, you were sent the presentation. I encourage you to read through it. Um, so it falls under what's called, the reason it's called a 504 is it falls under the section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. It's a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against public school students with disabilities and that includes students with learning and attention issues who meet certain criteria. Um, much like an IEP, a 504 can help students with learning and attention issues learn and participate in the general education curriculum a 504 plan outlines how a child's specific needs are met with accommodations, now in a public setting, modifications, and other services. They're measures that um, are removing barriers, barriers to learning. So I used a very simple example of a pair of glasses, right? Um, that's removing a barrier from allowing me to read uh, without getting a headache and, and stumbling on my words. Oversimplistic, but it helps, I think, get the idea of what an accommodation might be. A student with a 504 plan usually spends their entire day in general education classroom. So remember, an IEP is service-based. There are minutes attached to when they're going to be served through direct instruction, small group instruction, pull out or push in or co-taught. A 504 student, here's where it differs, is generally spending their whole day in an educational classroom. Um, typically, children who need educational classroom in a mainstream classroom, sorry, uh, typically children who need modifications would have uh, <clears throat> need modifications would have an IEP, not a 504 plan. So what we're saying there is um, if they need a lot of modifications, more than an accommodation can help them out, they really need all their assignments shortened. They really need to be in a separate room for learning. Um, that's where IEPs start to um, overshadow or become what is necessary for that child. And a 504 plan is not enough. Um, we're going to take a little bit more look at this. So they're for K through 12 public school students with disabilities. 504 defines a disability. Now, this is where um, it gets it's broad and um, and we, we own that. It is a very broad term. Um, it's why children who aren't eligible for an IEP, though, may qualify for a 504. Section 504 defines a person with a disability as someone who has a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major activity, reading and concentrating are 
very good examples of that. Has a record of impairment that is regarding as having is regarded as having such an impairment. Um, it's a definition that covers wide ranges of issues, including ADHD and learning disabilities. However, um, the 504 doesn't specifically list disabilities by name. So it's going to list the accommodations, but not necessarily why those accommodations have been put into place on the form. Um, because you have a disability doesn't automatically make uh, a student eligible. First, the school will do the evaluation, decide if the child's disability substantially limits the ability to learn and participate in a general ed classroom. And it's initiated either by a parent or sometimes by the school. So 504, accommodation-based, IEP service base. That's that's the, the broad big difference between the two. It is very possible that you'll move through an IEP evaluation and everybody at the end says, well, they didn't qualify. Then you as the parents say, well, they're still struggling. Could we talk about a 504 accommodation plan? What other opportunities are there for my child's educational needs to be met through leveling the play playing field through accommodations? So um Dig into that a little bit when you open up your PDF that you got from Joanna, and there's a lot more here about it. Um, you know, a 504 plan considers information from several sources. So it'll look at the child's documentation of disability. This is where your pediatrician's diagnosis may come in. Uh, it could look at evaluation results from an outside um, agency and or being evaluated for an IEP in a school. A teacher or a parent may be making observations of your child. Their academic record may play into them starting to move into a 504 plan. Um, a Section 504 requires an evaluation procedure that prevents students from being misclassified, incorrectly labeled as having a disability or incorrectly placed. So this is in here because we can't, um, you can't ask a school to put some accommodations in place on um, suspicion, right? You want to make sure that due diligence is done and that the right accommodations are in place. That's why an evaluation done either by the school or outside or a diagnosis from a qualified physician, pediatrician, psychiatrist, psychologist, it needs to be there to make this document um, appropriate and that it's fitting for your child. Ethan, how often do, IEF, do 504s get looked at? Is it annually? I can't quite remember. If I recall correctly, there is not a mandate that you need to look at it manually, uh, but most people, most districts do look at it uh, annually. Um, I may be incorrect with that. I might be a little fuzzy with that, but I, I believe that there's not an actual requirement. Okay. Thank you for answering that question. So what's in a 504? So Colin outlined all the different things that are sitting in an IEP. An IEP document, if you've never seen one or had one in your hands, you're looking at several pages of information that are placed on an IEP. Um, interesting thing about a 504, and in my experience, I've seen a lot of different 504s. There's really no um, standard to them that's required by law. Um, each district will handle it differently. So I mentioned, I think earlier, your 504 coordinator may be the school counselor. They may also be someplace completely different in like the special education department. So inquiring where that might be. Um, and then let's see, there's specific accommodations listed on. Most 504s I have seen are one page. It's, it's not often it goes to a second page. And if it does, it's because they're putting your name, your child's name and address and everything at the top of it. But it's, um, it's much shorter. The accommodations are listed. Some schools get very specific, some do not. Um, so they do vary quite a bit in what they look like. Um, it could be specialized instruction sometimes. Um, sometimes you'll see um, a child maybe still getting some speech and language services. Uh, articulation is a good example. So they're not always getting pulled out for speech, but maybe speech and language is still an issue for them. An accommodation you might see on a 504 would be um, not asking them to read out loud to the class, um, you know, because if they have an articulation issue, but they aren't doing speech and language therapy through an IEP anymore, you know, then you don't want to put them in a position where they um, are going to be uncomfortable. Um, occupational therapy can sometimes be on a 504 or even counseling. And then while we don't 
work with this as much at Groves. Um, there are public districts that will put um, significant health issues on a 504 accommodation plan. And that is usually operated through um, the nurse's office as well as a special education perhaps. That is taking a deeper dive in an area that we at Groves don't know as much about, um, but one of our resources at the end does, and it's Pacer Center. Um, so if your child has a disability that requires some medical interventions during school or a severe allergy or anything like that, and you're looking at a 504, definitely talk to your pediatrician or physician, but also reaching out to Pacer to get some clarity on what that would look like. Anything to add there, Ethan or Colin? No, that's really good. And, and again, that 504 could be could be something that that is temporary. It could be for an, an illness or something that um, you know they got hurt or injured or they have cancer or uh, those types of things where they could write an IEP um, providing accommodations that are reasonable um, that are coordinated with the nurse or whoever other healthcare provider uh, or or um, aid that might need uh, to to help with that. So. Um, they could be, again, very, it could be something that's ongoing or it could be something that's temporary as well. So, Thanks, Colin, for pointing yeah. that out. Um, this is really talking about who, who's doing this, uh, the team or the committee that's helping with the 504. It could be special education. It could be counselors. It could be a, a combination of teachers and counselors. So um, it could be so a lot more gen ed teachers are appearing or their regular classroom teachers in creating accommodations. Uh, you'll get a copy of it. Um, you want to keep an eye on how it's being implemented. Now, kiddos in, um, you know, K through about fifth, sixth grade, um, probably, remember we talked about self-advocacy, they're not developmentally really in that place to say, hey, I need extra time on my test, right? They're, they're not there. They can't do that. So you as the parent or the guardian um, are really the over, I don't want to say the overseer, but you're that partner with that teacher to remind and to, um, to help guide and say, oh, well, we have an accommodation plan. Now, K through like four or five, most kids only have one or two teachers. And so communicating a 504 plan isn't as challenging as it is when you get to middle school and high school. You're dealing with multiple teachers that can change on a quarterly basis, on a trimester basis, on a semester basis. Um, so working as a parent to let them know that that is out there, um, and that you expect your child to be able to have access to these things. If you start to run into problems with that, reach out to administration and, and call a meeting. Um, now we do have sent, don't wait until next year's 504 planning meeting to raise your concerns. So that tells me, Ethan, that um, 504s can be reviewed a little more frequently. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and, a, and answer a question live too. So okay. 504s can be can be reviewed more frequently, but quite honestly, so can IEPs. You yeah. you can ask to have those those meetings a little bit more frequently and making sure that things are occurring uh, uh, at 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 uh, a, at a level that that you feel a little bit more comfortable with. Uh, I have a question about unspecified ADHD, and this this goes into IEPs and 504 plans. So. Uh, I do have a question about my, my, you know, like my child was was diagnosed with ADHD and, and it was considered unspecified ADHD. Uh, and what implications does this have? And, and you know, should the student be able to qualify for for uh, an IEP? Um, and um, and so uh, there, there's a couple of different layers to this. Um, an unspecified ADHD, as I was mentioning in the beginning, there's a whole spectrum. Even when we talk about a learning disorder, attention disorder, there's a spectrum. Uh, with unspecified, uh, that is a very common diagnosis that might most commonly, that means it wasn't documented across two or more settings. Um, there could be a, many other reasons why unspecified ADHD is, is diagnosed. This will prohibit a child from being qualifying for an IEP because a full diagnosis of ADHD needs to be, uh, be present uh, and it needs to be documented. Now, this does not prohibit a 504 plan. Uh, so accommodations should still be able to be applied with an unspecified ADHD diagnosis. Um, so I'm gonna cancel that. So I answered that one live. Um, and, the, and we just answered Jenny's question. A 504 plan can be reviewed more frequently. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I am. Um, I'm going to say I learned something there tonight. 
um, on the uh, unspecified with ADHD. Thank you, Ethan. Can I can I add something to Brianna's question too? Um, I recently had to go through this as well too. So and correct me if I'm wrong, Ethan or Kim, but um, it, when you're going through um, the evaluation process um, and you don't agree uh, with the the assessment, you can also ask um, the school district to um to provide uh, an outside another outside evaluation and that would be on the school district to provide that um and and that could be kind of uh mediated between you two but you do have that right to ask um it's not guaranteed but you have the right to ask and um and they have a, a right to respond so that may or may not be um on your dime as well so that's something that you can you can uh, look into and, and look into the the laws around that Thank you, Colin. It actually leads right into um, our next slide. So what happens if you don't agree with a 504 plan? And actually, I would say um, you could almost put IEP on here as well. If you disagree with the school's decisions about your child's education, there are several ways to dispute it. Here are some steps you can take, and usually in this order. Um, so even before you request a, a mediator, uh, and I know Colin, you just went through this. You go back and you go, I, can we get everybody together again? I, I'm not so sure this is accurate, uh, an accurate representation of my child. Or I spotted some rather inflammatory language in here that I'm not sure belongs here. So you have the ability as a parent to call everybody back and, and go through this one more time and give a district or a school or a team a chance to respond. Um, however, if if moving along, that's not getting you everyone where they need to be, you can request a mediator uh, and they to help you reach a, an agreement with the school. Um, you can ask for a hearing before an impartial hearing officer. That's probably that's that next part. You can file a complaint with the Federal Office of Civil Rights um, and you can also file a lawsuit. Um, now, my experience, districts want to never even get to bullet point number one. They want to try and navigate and figure this out um, before everybody has to really get in deep and into disagreement and into more, um, you know, gnarling around things. So um, they try really hard uh, to, to find that spot that everybody can come to an agreement. But there are there is a process um, if it needs to go beyond that. Um, so what makes the journey easier? And this applies to everything as we're getting close to, um, to wrapping up things here. Um, you know, know your child's issues, observe your child. Um, it can help you have a better understanding of their strengths, their weaknesses, and their needs. Explore supports, find out about accommodations that help students with learning and attention issues. Um, and we will be taking a look at resources here at the end to really guide you and, and show you a few places to look at that. Ethan, did you have a question that came I through? Got, I got, yes, I did have a question and, and one that I am stumped on. Uh, so the question is, who is the mediator for 504 plans? Now, I have been involved with mediation for uh, IEPs. I have never been involved with a mediation with the 504 plan. So I am actually unaware of who that is. Now, I would guess it is some sort of district representative. Yeah. But I believe the mediator is someone that is neutral. Um, um, so uh, unless Kim or Colin, if you know the answer, if you've ever been involved with the 504 mediation. I believe you're correct, um, Ethan, on what yeah. you're saying. So they start to pull in impartial. Uh, I think I a parent once shared with me they um what they'll do is call in a different district to come in and take a look at everything if they need to so they'll take it outside of the building first to their supervisor or the district level but if it right. needs to go beyond that um i i'm pretty sure she said they called in someone from a neighboring district to come take a look and help them navigate through it um but that's again for 504s that's pretty rare uh to run into in my experience it sounds like in yours as well Good yeah. question. Yeah. Um, very good question. Um, can I move on a little bit and let's get towards the last part? We're doing a lot of Q&A along the way though, so it's working out pretty well. Um, uh, partner with your teachers as much as you can. Now I know every year you get a different teacher and there's different personalities, but remember they're spending a lot of time with your child. So um, find a way in communicating with them, um, 
and to be an advocate for your child along that way if you need to. Um, see what is working. If there's if your kid, child comes home one day and goes, wow, we did this today and I learned so much. Hop in and tell your teacher, I don't know what happened today, but boy, did he really like the way you approached this story today. Or um, for some reason, math went really good for him today. Was something different? Uh, and the teacher might say, huh, yeah, we use manipulatives today. Or I got out magnetic boards. Who knew? Um, and then so that might help that teacher unlock a little bit of a mystery around your child as well. Um, so share with that teacher. Um, get advice from parents, uh, experts. There's parenting coaches or parenting coach offers tips that may address aspects um, of your child's 504 plan. Um, live chats are opportunities to ask questions directly to experts. I've mentioned PACER once. I will mention PACER again. Um, they are an outstanding resource in the state of Minnesota for parents. And they um, also, if they go back into live presentations again, um, you sit amongst parents who are doing the exact same thing that you're doing, trying to navigate the same exact system. And more than one time I've walked out of those and seen parents just that never met talking. What district are you in? What's working? Tell me more about that resource. What was that accommodation? So um, PACER is a terrific, terrific resource for helping navigate everything. Anything to add here before we move on? Um, so an effective 504 plan is designed to meet the needs of your child. That's a key takeaway. Uh, an informal accommodation will have the law behind them if they're formalized in a 504 plan. So what that's saying is teachers like, oh yeah, I'm gonna give them extra time. Mm, could we maybe make that a little more formal? Because they're may what if you're not there? What if uh, next year it, everything changes and I, and I have to then climb uphill? I'd rather go through a process right now. I appreciate teacher that you're trying to do this for them, but I would just be more comfortable if we made it a little more formal. Um, and then you may need to be proactive, proactive about participating in the 504 meetings. So that's really saying to reminding teachers that they exist, reminding them those documents are sitting there. So an IEP includes direct services. They're both legal documents. A 504 is more student and or parent directed and they're responsible for ensuring the accommodations are, are provided. So, um, and again, I'm, I've said it a few times, school counselors, 504 coordinator, sometimes special education department, those are the writers and the editors, and those are the people that help follow through with the accommodations. IEP is all special education department. Here's some resources. Uh, in Minnesota, Minnesota Department of Education, um, I also transition kids into other states, and so um, I'll be looking at other Department of Education web pages. Now, I will say MDE is, it's big. There's a lot of stuff there, but it's really not too hard to navigate when I considered um, a few other states that I've been trying to navigate through those to try and find, you know, how do you qualify for this and how do you qualify for that? So um, we have a pretty good uh, Department of Education as far as an information resource. I have said PACER Center over and over and over again. They offer free webinars. I attend some every year. Um, they keep me up to date personally on IEP cha changes in IEP law. Um, it is um, a, a free service to families. They also have an outstanding assistive technology uh, library um, to check out different types of assistive technology. So can't say enough about PACER. Federal law, um, rights law is uh, pretty well known in getting into the federal laws and the ins and outs of IEPs. Uh, they run seminars, they have a newsletter that they put out, uh, it used to be bi-weekly, and I think it still is. Um, and then one of the things Ethan mentioned to me is a special, a special education clinic being put together through the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Um, and so there's not, he and I looked when we were preparing for this. They don't have anything out there yet, but Ethan happens to have a little inside track that they are working on that. Um, so my hope is next year we're able to say, here's where you need to go. Um, St. Thomas is getting pretty serious about learning disabilities, making sure that their teachers and educators, as well as their law students, understand the rights of students uh, when it comes to um, getting an education. And there we go. Questions, what else do we have out there?
I'll answer this one live. So, so this, the, I have a question about, um, I have a child that, that uh, is about ready to, for the, the results to come through for the IEP. But the gathering info is coming up. What should I do before the meeting? What should I do to prepare? Um, hoping, we were hoping that he qualifies, but if they don't, should we ask another special ed team to look at this? Okay, so what I would do is, is definitely go in with an open mind. Now, Kim is exactly right, is that, um, that we know our child's the best. Okay, um, and, and that is really important for us to keep considering as we jump into these uh, discussions with, with schools. I also find it very helpful not to get to be too emotionally charged with it and, and kind of come in and, and be as open as possible. They may be adhering to federal criteria that they might have no if and ends or, or ways about it. So, so even if we feel completely like a child and they qualify for special education services. Sometimes the data just does not align with it. And, and sometimes the, the school districts and the, and the schools' hands are crossed. They're, they're, they don't really have anywhere else to go. Now, if you are very sure that your students should be qualifying, or if you doubt the results, you can request what's called an independent educational evaluation or an IEE. And, and so this goes through mediation. You, you, you would talk with the district and you would always request this in writing. And you could have them uh, evaluated by an independent evaluator to see if the conclusions come to the same, same results or not. Uh, we at Groves, we do multiple IEEs a year. Um, and, and we really pride ourselves on being that independent person between um, the, the parents and the family and the district. And there are times where we find the districts of where their conclusions were, were not absolutely right. And there are times where we find that the conclusions for the districts are, are exactly where they should have been. So um, if you have questions on that and, and you'd like a second look at it, you can always contact me and, and send me the, the evaluation uh, and I can give you my honest and direct feedback. Um, and we do that a lot with families. So if you ever have questions on a diagnosis, I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Ethan. Any other questions out there or ones that you uh, answered to an individual that would be worth sharing? I think you've done a nice job of popping them in. All right. Um, well, with that, Joanna, uh, we have our contact information here. Groves Learning Organization, we are a school that's been around, as Colin said, since 1972. We are also a learning center. That's where um, Ethan is based that does diagnostic assessments for members of our community, as well as our own students. We also have speech and language therapy. Uh, we have five speech and language pathologists that work with our students, but also students in the public and in the community. And then tutoring, um, I would be amiss to not mention that because I used to manage it up there. Um, so we do offer tutoring to our community as well. So, you know, you have a child that's struggling um, or diagnosed with a learning disability, um, reach out to Groves through the Learning Center um, if you're looking for some resources. We offer a great summer program as well. I think it's full this summer, but um, you know, for the future, it's a four week program. It's all geared, small classrooms We're all about um, working with students with learning differences. That's who we are. That's, that's our core all the time. And we are a school as well. Um, so with that, uh, reach out to us if you need anything. Anything else on housekeeping or anything, Joanna? Um, yeah, I'll just reiterate for anyone that maybe logged on after my spiel at the beginning. Um, if you're an educator, do reach out to me um, when I email you tomorrow if you need a CEU credit for this workshop. And we are we did record this, so we will also send you the link in case you missed any of the presentation tonight or just want to refer back to it again. And that's it. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Colin, Kim, and Ethan. Uh, hopefully everybody got some great information out of this. All right. All right. Thank you very Good much. Night. Have a great evening, and thanks for all your great questions.